Hi, I'm Daniel Chan from UNSW Sydney. Welcome to another adventure in pure mathematics. Today I want to show you how the rather algebraic gadget called homology can be used to capture topological information. And I want to do this in the simplest possible setting, and that's the setting that you get when you study graphs. So let's uh, look at our setup. In this case, we're going to have a directed graph. And our notation for that graph is gamma. We have a set of edges, gamma 1, and a set of vertices, gamma 0. So if E is an edge in gamma 1, it goes from the tail of E, T of E, to the head of E, H of E. They're the vertices. Usually we just draw the directed graph rather simply like this, and here's an example. So where does the topology come in? So recall that given any such graph, it gives us a topological space. So this one here, for example, is just, you just join these all up to give you a square inside here, union, a line segment. And the point is that the graph can tell you about this top topology here. For example, you can use the graph to tell you about the connected components. Of the underlying topological space. And let me just remind you how that goes. It's quite interesting. What we do is we're going to put an equivalence relation on the set of vertices. The equivalence relation is going to be generated by the tail of an edge is equivalent to the head of an edge. So in other words, this vertex is equivalent to this one. And to generate an equivalence relation, we just have to make sure that we enforce reflexivity, symmetry, and transitivity. So in this case, all these four points are equivalent to each other. So that's one connected component. And these two vertices are equivalent to each other. And they, that gives another con connected component. So that's how the graph can be used to capture the connected components as the equivalence classes. Now what we want to do in homology is we want to linearize this equivalence relation. Now homology and cohomology, they're linear theories. And that makes them easier to compute with, and it means that you can use the techniques of linear algebra to bear upon the problems at hand. Of course, in the process, you lose a little bit of information, and sometimes it's too much, but often we find that it's still very, very useful. So let's see how we can linearize this equivalence relation. So firstly, we have to linearize, so to speak, the set of vertices and the set of edges, and that's quite easily done. We consider the vector space V0 with basis given by the set of vertices, and we consider the vector space V1 with the basis, the set E of edges in gamma 1. And what about linearizing this equivalence relation here? The tail of E is equivalent to H of E. Well, instead of looking at the tail of E is equivalent to H of E, we consider the difference between these two. These are two vertices, and so you can consider the difference between them as a linear combination of two vertices, and hence an element of V0. So what we'll do is look at the linear map which sends an edge E, that's a basis element inside your V1, to H of E minus T of E. So the image of D is just the subspace of V0 generated by these elements here. And modulo this image of D, of course this is 0, which just tells you that the head of E is congruent to the tail of E modulo the image of D. And this completely reflects the fact that the tail of E is equivalent to the head of E here. What's more, how do you generate the equivalence relation? You just impose reflexivity, symmetry, and transitivity. To get the image of D, you look at the subspace generated by So closure under addition 
more or less corresponds to transitivity. Closure under negation corresponds to symmetry. And the closure under the zero corresponds to reflexivity. So this precisely linearizes the equivalence relation that we've had before. OK, so we have one linear map. And if you remember from my video on what is cohomology, we need two linear maps which compose to zero to get homology or cohomology. So to this, there are two ways you can get a composite to get zero very easily. You can either start from zero and map to V1 and then go to V0. Or you can start here, use D to get to V0 and then go to zero with the zero map there. So there are two places where you can apply the definition for cohomology. Although in this case we call it homology just because the map D goes from V1 to V0, it lowers these indices. Okay, so let's look at the two examples. If we look at the kernel of this map, it's all of V0. And the image of this one is just the image of D. That we call H0 of gamma. The zero corresponds to the fact that this had index zero, and that's the middle of the three terms. We can look at this sequence here of three vector spaces. And in this case, we look at the kernel of this map, which is the kernel of D, modulo the image of this map, which is zero. So H1 of gamma is just the kernel of D. So in this setup, we immediately get two homology groups. H0 and H1. Okay, so what topological information is captured in these two algebraic objects, the zeroth homology and the first homology? Well, I claim the following. This zeroth homology just is R to the N, where N is the number of connected components of the underlying topological space. And in many ways, we kind of expect this because how do we construct this homology? How do we motivate this? We use a linearized version of the equivalence relation used to capture the connected components graph theoretically. So this is something that you would expect. So let me show you how it's true in this particular case here. So H0 is just V0 modulo the image of D. The elements of V0 are just linear combinations of vertices. And the easiest way to represent that is to put numbers at these vertices, which gives you the coefficients. So we can have, for example, 3 of this vertex minus 1 of this vertex plus pi of this vertex then plus two of these, and we can have zero of this vertex here minus one of these vertices. Now remember, modulo the image of D, each of the vertices in one connected component, they're all congruent to each other. So if we can move these scalars across to one of the vertices, whichever one we like, and this contributes a single R. This one connected component contributes a single R. And similarly, the other connected component contributes a single R. And that's why the zeroth homology is R to the N, where N is the number of connected components. Well, what about H1? Remember, that's the kernel of D. And that turns out also to have a topological interpretation. It's R to the M where M is the number of independent cycles. Okay, so maybe you don't understand what that means. I think if I give you an example of something that's in here, you'll see why this is true and what this means. Okay, so the kernel of D, we need a linear combination of edges such that when we apply D, it gets zero. So let's just start with an edge like this one. Suppose we have one of them. When we apply D, we get a linear combination of vertices. What's that? It's the head of this minus the tail. So we have the head, so that's one of them, and the 
the minus one here. So it's not zero. To make this zero here, we need to cancel it with the tail of an edge. So we need to add an edge like this one here. We have one of them. That gets rid of that. But we have an extra head here. So we need to cancel this. And to cancel this, we need a tail of an edge. So we add that one here. That will cancel that. And that leaves a one here. And then to cancel this one and this one, we can do that with a single edge, this one here. So this single cycle here turns out to give an element inside here. And that's how a cycle gives you an element of H1. And it turns out that, in fact, this describes all of H1. It's R to the M, where M is the number of independent cycles. Let me just conclude with some final remarks. So the first thing is that this is the simplest example that can occur. Topological spaces which come from graphs. And they, of course, give topological spaces which, in a certain sense, are one-dimensional. But there are higher dimensional analogues of this theory. If you want to look at surfaces and higher things like that, you have to use higher dimensional analogues of graphs called simplicial complexes. And when you do that, you'll find there's not just an H0 and an H1, but an H2 and an H3, and so forth, going up to the dimension of the topological space. And in fact, this procedure is a very good way to study topological spaces in general because many topological spaces can be represented by graphs or more generally by some plissial complexes. But one of the things that's rather interesting, and this is a feature of homological algebra, is that the representation of the topological space is not unique. So this topological space here is essentially up to homeomorphism, just a circle or a square and a line segment. We could have broken this up into two directed edges instead by inserting an extra vertex and breaking this one edge into two. If you do that, you change your v0 and your v1. The set of vertices and the set of edges has changed. But miraculously, of course, the H0 and the H1, they don't change because their topological invariance and the underlying topological space hasn't changed. So this is a very important feature in homological algebra. Very often you're in a situation, you try to represent an object, which you can do in lots of different ways, but it turns out that it doesn't matter how you represent it, you always get the same answer. You might have seen an example of this before in the topological Euler characteristic that you meet when you study compact-oriented surfaces. In that case, we triangulate a surface. And you might remember the formula for the topological Euler characteristic is it's the number of vertices minus the number of edges plus the number of faces. Now, of course, that triangulation can change quite a bit. So these V's, E's, and F's, they can change quite a lot. Well, the point is that homology, in many ways, is a refinement of this topological invariant. You can actually rewrite this topological Euler characteristic, in the case of a compact-oriented surface, as an alternating sum of three dimensions of vector spaces. And those vector spaces are the zeroth homology, the first homology, and the second homology. And these three numbers don't change, unlike these three numbers. So what was now, what was previously just a single topological invariant, this Euler characteristic, has now been split into three invariants. And each of these contains topological information. This one still measures somehow the number of connected components. This one still measures somehow the number of one-dimensional cycles. And this one now measures, in some sense, the number of two-dimensional cycles. So it's in this way that this topological Euler characteristic now can be refined into 
more topological invariants which have direct meaning, and also it's no longer just a number. These are actually vector spaces, and that means that you can apply more results from linear algebra to try to study them. I hope you enjoyed this adventure in pure mathematics. To see more, you can have a look at my website.